I wrote up the proof, uh, actually following the proof of Josef Schicho, and as it turns out, to give all the details will be too much in this class. So I will do just as much as you need to get the flavor how the argument is, is going, but I'm not going to do all the computations here. So <clears throat> before doing so, I want to recall the incidence graph. This was number five. Oh, maybe, uh, sorry. Today we are March 15, I think. Is this correct or something, approximately? And our <coughs> object of interest are incidence graphs. Gamma x. Of course, we did this already, but as it's a little bit uh, a while ago, let me recall what we have. So we have x equals xt, t in n true 3, a string in yn. So recall this means all cross ratios equal. And at least three different entries each xt, at least three different entries. And <clears throat> we want to associate to this x a graph gamma of x, which will be the incidence graph. So this will be a phylogenetic tree. which means it's a planar graph, finite, no loops, no double edges, and no vertices of degree 2. So <clears throat> if xt is an n-gon of x denote by bracket xt, it's PGL2 orbit or let's say the equivalence class given by the PGL2 action. And then we define gamma of x, which will consist of vertices and edges, and also a set of labels. So n will be typically 1 up to n, the labels. But we don't have to use these numbers here. And the vertices, the set of vertices, is just the set of orbits, xt, t in n true 3. And uh, the edges, so these are the inner vertices. Maybe I should, yeah, union the set n. And uh, the labels here are the leaves with labels from n. The leaves of the graph. Leaf means a vertex of degree 1. And uh, the interesting thing was the definition of the edges. So E contains an edge, let me write it, E equal xs xt, if and only if. Now recall we had incidence sets. So the incidence set, sets of xt collect, or they are bookkeeping which entries of xt are equal to each other equal entries. So these intersets are subsets of n, and we get a partition of n. I hope you remember. And we call two vertices adjacent or connected by an edge if xs and xt share a complementary Incident sets.
So let me draw one example. So if we have an extremal string, x. So an extremal string was one which has only entries 0, 1, or infinity. And then we get a gamma of x as follows. I have my blue here. As usual, the inner vertices are in blue, and the inner edges This, uh, <clears throat> so to have a phylogenetic tree, we have to add here one leaf and here always two. OK, so all blue vertices have degree three. And uh, just to, to recall a little bit how this worked, if this would be xs and this would be the orbit of xt here, then this would be the edge e. And uh, let me draw the, the complementary incident set. So here, you remember, we have this destination business. Here you have three edges leaving xt, one to the left, one to the right, and one up. And if you leave here, you will reach a whole bunch of, of labels, of leaves. And the entries of xt with these indices, with these labels, are all equal. Then here we have what is called a singleton. So maybe I should add here, these have the the labels here are i, j, k, l, m, and so on. Okay, And then we have a third one, a third incident set, which is this one, Okay, for xt. And uh, maybe in yellow, I try to draw the incident set of xs. So here we have to take these together, so we get something like this, and uh, we get these here and these here. So this is yellow, this pen is again almost gone, and this is green. Okay, I hope you can see something. So this was the construction of these trees. And the, the whole business is use the geometry of these phylogenetic trees to make your proofs. Use phylogenetic geometry to find your proofs of various statements. Yeah. So this is kind of bookkeeping. OK, so we had the following proposition. I just briefly recall. These incidence graphs are phylogenetic trees. Gamma x is a phylogenetic tree. Number two. All phylogenetic trees arise as gamma x. We proved this already, at least we skipped the proof. And see something which is interesting. If you have an, such an extremal uh, tree, extremal trees, correspond to a unique 
extremal string. So if you have such a, an extremal tree, as uh, extremal string will only have 0, 1s, and infinity, you just have to check which ones are equal or not, when or not, and that's codified in the tree. Okay? And the, uh, we get a stratification, obtain stratification of yn by the gamma x. What do I mean by stratification? So if we take, uh, let me call this t, if we take all y in yn. Sorry to interrupt, but what you're writing is out of the image for me. Could you move the board up a bit? Oh, yes. Uh, how did this? Let me see. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I still reach the top. Uh, somebody had moved it. Sorry. Thank you for calling me. So if you take those strings which have gamma y equal to t, then it's not hard to show that this in yn is locally closed. In the Zariski topology, which means it is a difference of algebraic subsets. And we have the big stratum, so the, the, the one big open set in yn, which corresponds to the generic string, so big. These sets are called strata of the stratification. Strata. So it is a partition. It is a partition of yn in various pieces. And you have one big open dense set, big open dense subset. And this is just those strings which have all entries different, so they correspond to the generic tree. And the generic tree is just the opposite from an extremal one. It has one vertex and n leaves, which means that all entries are different. Okay. And uh, so you, you have to imagine this maybe like this. Uh, this is only a schematic picture. This is your big open subset. And then you have kind of boundary components. Let me draw it like this. You have one stratum here, one stratum here, one stratum here of smaller dimension. And then you still have smaller strata which are maybe these vertices. Okay, So that's what, how you have to imagine the stratification of a space. Yeah, it's a decomposition. And you have one big open subset, which is dense. And then the, the difference, the remainder, the complement of this big open is, again, composed by various disjoint subsets, actually uh, algebraic subsets or differences of them. Okay, so. Inside here, you will have your generic strings. All entries are different. And the, the, green, the green ones are the extremal ones. Yeah? So these are these unique, unique strings corresponding to an extremal tree. Okay? So that's the geometric picture on the side of yn. So we have two geometries. We have the geometry. All this here would be yn. Okay. Of course, it's not the real truth, but how you have to think of it. And here we have the geometry of the tree. Is this OK for everybody so far? Uh, so having a stratification is a 
very frequent method to investigate algebraic varieties. So, uh, da -dee -da -da. by the way, we had this exercise. You remember this exercise about counting? No, not yeah. Of ordering, of ordering k tuples. Uh, of labels. I'm not sure if uh, somebody succeeded. It took me quite a while. I, I don't present the solution here because it's not so beautiful as I expected. Uh, it's kind of hand knitted, and it seems that there is no elegant solution. But in the notes, which will hopefully come soon, I will work this out. But I have a second exercise. Just a second. An easier exercise, actually an almost trivial exercise, is to prove this part C here. Uh, it's, it's really. No big deal. Proof C. And it is very educational because it gives you a flavor how these arguments work. Okay. So let us let us accept this proposition. We proved the various parts of it. So now we want to prove the goal is or the theorem. Yn is a smooth algebraic variety. So a manifold. And that's not completely trivial. But, uh, and that's of course is known classically, but with complicated proofs. Here's the proof is also a little bit involved, but it is elementary. And we prove this in several steps. And the first thing we have to do is, you know, when you want to prove that something is a manifold, you cover your space by many open subsets, an open covering, and then you show that on each of these open subsets, you have a diffeomorphism or homeomorphism to an open subset of affine space. And these are the chart maps. Okay? So there are two things to do. First, you have to construct this covering, yeah, because it can only work locally. For instance, if you take the, the real circle, S1, to show that S1 is a one-dimensional manifold, you have to cover it by two arcs, yeah, which overlap at least two arcs. Now, you cannot do it globally. So we need the covering. And then we need, once we have the covering, we have to construct the chart maps. And we have to show that the chart maps are injective. Okay? So that's the program for today. And uh, so all this is, uh, was suggested in cooperation with Josef Schicho and Tsai Yue Ki. So uh, I'm very impressed how many ideas they developed. So let me start with a lemma. To prove this, let us first construct an open cover of Yn. And this goes by means of the following lemma. We take x in yn an extremal string. And actually, there are only finitely many of them. There are only finitely many of them.
Why? Yes, because we know that the extremal strings are characterized by extremal trees. And extremal trees with n leaves, of course, they are only finitely many. Because there are only finitely many extremal trees use this was d c of the proposition. But we don't use it. There are only finitely many. So what does it mean, extremal string? Uh, it has only entries 0, 1, and infinity. All entries of n-gons xt are 0, 1, or infinity. So they are kind of boring. So it's only a combinatorial information where the equal entries sit. Okay. And uh, we take, uh, we associate to them a third of the quadruples. So n upper index 4 was the set of quadruples i, j, k, l in n. And being extremal means that the cross ratios of the n-gons here are only 0, 1, or infinity as well. So for all q in n4 cross q of x, so this is also cross q of xt. So one remark here. If we take an n-gon of such a string x, let's call it xt, there are two options. Either the cross ratio with respect to q is defined, and then it does not depend on xt because yn is a set of strings where the n-gons have all equal cross ratios. That's why we can write it as the cross ratio of the whole string. And uh, it could also be that this is not defined because the three respective entries are equal. So this holds if defined. Recall that the cross ratio is not defined if three entries are equal. OK. So <clears throat> now we take a subset of these. Uh, maybe I call it mx in n4. Yeah. So here, as we only have entries 0, 1, and infinity in our n-gons, this will belong again to 0, 1 infinity. And we take, let me call it mx1. These are the quadruples q in n4, the cross ratio of q x is 1. So this is just the cardinality of this set is just uh, one third of the cardinality of n to n of the all quadruples. This is one third of the quadruples. Okay. Of course, if you if you permute i j k l, then the cross ratio will jump from zero to one and to infinity and so on. Okay. Now I have to erase again. It's a pity to erase this extremal tree. Maybe I use it uh, soon. Yeah, maybe I keep it. Uh, da, de, da, da. I think you allow me to erase all of this. I hope you have you have copied it already. Now we define the covering. 
I hope I can erase this also. Otherwise, you, either you take notes or you have to remember a little bit the notation. Okay, so once we have chosen this set of quadruples, I don't need this here, we define ux. These are the strings. So recall x is fixed and extremal. Fixed, extremal. We take all y in yn, the cross ratio q of y is either 1, oh, sorry, equal 1 or non special. Non special means different 0 infinity. So you could just say these are the strings where the cross ratio is different from 0 and infinity for all q in m1x. So whenever the cross ratio of x equals 1, then the cross ratio of y is not allowed to be 0 or infinity. So this is clearly open. because it is just given by this inequality, and the cross ratio is a rational function in the entries of the n-gons. Okay. So with this definition, we have the following statement then. So I, let me write it again. 1 ux is open. Number two, uh, if gamma y can be obtained from gamma x by a sequence of edge contraction then y is in ux so let me recall what <coughs> i mean by edge contraction take for instance this edge let me call it f here from here to here so if you contract this what do you get I draw it below. Here everything stays the same. But this vertex, let me call this vertex maybe V and W. And here we will glue V and W and we eliminate F. So we get now these two edges here will come here, and the, the leaves remain as they are. And you see, doing so, you will get here now a vertex of degree 4. 
Okay, it has four edges, whereas V and W just have three edges, degree three. So this is what we understand by a contraction of edges, of inner edges. And we can continue. If we contract now this one and this one, if we continue, where do we end up? And we can contract all edges, and at the very end, generic tree. the generic tree. Very good. So this is a very controlled process, and you know precisely what is happening. Yeah, because you see the distribution of leaves. No? So maybe one remark here. If you go an interesting, now we do playing around with, with these trees. If you take. I have already used i, j, k, l. Let me call this a, b, c, d. a, b, c, d. Now, for this vertex v, as we have this edge going out, and these are possible destinations, a, b, c, d are incidence set of v. You agree? No? By our rule, we go one edge, and these are the train stations we leave by. We arrive if we take the exit f. Now here, in this picture, we see that we have again a, b, c, d. But now, all four together are no longer an incident set. Here, so this corresponds to here. But down here, we have a, b, and c, d are incident sets of v equal w. So what you see is that the incident sets get partitioned. Yeah? So it's a refinement of the incidence partition. Contraction of edges produces a refinement of incident sets. And once you are down here at the generic tree, here all are singletons. So the incident sets are here just one element sets, yeah, because all entries are different. Okay. So this was the concept of edge contractions. And you can characterize the element in this open neighborhood just in terms of their tree. This is here just one direction, but I think the opposite direction going back also works. And three, ux, x in yn extremal is an open cover of yn. And precisely on these open subsets, we will construct the charts. OK? So do we want to prove this? So what's the time? It's 37. I would like to do it, but I don't want to overrule you. And I don't want to overload you, because it's a little bit, yeah, at least the so one is clear. I'm hesitating about two. I will certainly prove three. So proof of lemma. One is clear. So I think two is easier if you do it yourself uh, instead of explaining it here. You use this, this refinement procedure. Okay. So you have to control how the, how the cross ratios can change if you pass from an extremal tree to a contracted tree. Okay. So 
Let me give you a hint. If x uh, is extremal, recall this in particular means cross qx is 1 for all quadruples in this m1x. Now, what does this mean? If you take xt and q equals ijkl, that's a rule which I explained a long time ago. If the cross ratio is x, then either this is equivalent to, if it is 1, sorry. If the cross ratio with respect to ijkl is 1, it is equivalent to say that xti is equal to xtj, so either. Either the first two are equal, or xtk equal xtl. The last two are equal. Okay. Now, in particular, it implies that xti is different from xtk, and also here. Okay. And if you now contract one edge, yeah, and y is obtained from x by, let's just take one edge contraction. Afterwards, you can iterate. Then you have to observe what happens with the cross ratio. Cross qy. So you just have to make sure that it cannot become 0 or infinity. But this is induced by looking at these pictures. Yeah, you, you have to locate your labels i, j, k, l in the extremal tree. You contract, and then you just have to check that for y, you also have these inequalities. Yeah, so y, t, i is different, y, t, k, and y, t, j is different, y, t, l. And this follows just from the graph. So is different 0 infinity. Okay, so this is by looking. Look at tree, at the tree. On the light board, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but if you do it yourself, you will see one such picture suffices, and you will enjoy it. I'm sure that you will like it. Okay. So this is number two, and number three is the covering. So I think now I can erase my contracted tree, and then we will make a break. So of course, you can blame me and say, yes, this business with the trees, it's just a smart way to control all the combinatorial information. And the combinatorial information suffices to prove things. That's true to a certain extent, but nobody did it before. Yeah. So there's some credit to it. So let us prove that it is an open cover. And then we will make a break. I hope you are still alive. So what we do is we start with let y in y n be arbitrary. With three gamma y. So what we'll do, we'll construct an extremal string. We construct x in yn extremal 
this y in ux. And then we are done. No, you agree. So how do we construct this? We construct this extremal tree by its, its extremal string by constructing its extremal tree. It suffices to construct gamma x extremal by c from before from the proposition. Once we have an extremal tree, we know that it has a unique string. So what we do is, we have seen in 2 that we get these elements in ux by contraction of extremal trees. And now we do the opposite. Apply the opposite procedure of edge contraction, and we call it called edge insertion. And like this, stepwise, stepwise, we iterate, we will arrive at an extremal tree. And I, I give you the picture. It's very easy. Let me take here this is certainly not an extremal tree because here we have degree 4. Maybe we even have something like this. So we have many vertices of degree 4. Maybe I, I take them in green. This one is not good. This one is not good. This one is not good. No? They have degree at least 4. So in order to decrease, this one even has degree 5. So in order to decrease the degree, we replace this vertex by an edge. So this will go into, let me draw, let me call this v. We produce an edge, which I call e of v. And then. It doesn't matter, we call this maybe the new v, and this we call it w. So this, in contraction, it will come, become v. And now we, we just distribute our edges as we want, but keeping in a phylogenetic tree. So maybe we take, so this edge here will go here. Let me call this here u. So here we have u. And then we could place, for instance, 3 here, the same as before. And we only move this, this leaf here, we move it to this place. So there's no uniqueness, of course. Yeah? But we don't, we don't mind. So now, the new v will have degree 4. Here we have degree 5, degree 4. So this, this extremal string which we construct, it is not unique because, you know, as you have a covering by these ux, they will overlap. And your string y may belong to several of these. Yeah? We just construct one open set which contains y. So if we continue here, we will arrive at an extremal tree because the degrees of each vertex, of at least one vertex, will drop. Okay? And then this gives us x. And uh, we have to show that y 
belongs to this UX. This produces an extremal string x and gamma y is obtained by uh, sorry uh, obtained from gamma x now we take again the edge contraction by edge contractions isn't this nice so now you apply two. Huh? Y is in UX. So this implies Y in UX. Did you follow? Do you capture a little bit the flavor? It's that was the easy part in some sense. So we will make five minutes break as usual to recover a little bit, and then I will jump into the smoothness, at least in the case of n equals 5. Okay, So let's have a short uh, break to take some water.
Okay, we are back again. I hope you are all back. So <clears throat> now we come to the proof of the theorem. Uh, sorry, just one short question. Yes, please. I mean, it's, it's like you have, let's say, your trees on n leaves. Yes. And basically, by contraction or by like inserting edges, in some way you can get from any tree to any tree. Not really. Yeah, I mean, if you if you take both uh, contraction and insertion, then you can go from anyone to <coughs> anyone. Yes. But if you yeah. only if you only allow contractions, you you end up at the generic tree. Yeah. No, no, I mean, it's, it's really, you, you allow both. Yeah, then, um, yeah. Okay, and, and, and basically, at the end of the day, you still, still only get some kind of, of finite number of possible trees. Yes, yes. And, mm -hmm. and you have, like, you, you how to say, and, and if, like, for, for every type of tree, you take some point and, and, like, connect them by edges, which correspond to inserting or da, da, da. Yes. to get some graph. And my question would be, is this a group in some weird way or not? Because you can always go back. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. uh, oh, Maybe, maybe. Uh, but uh, even if it would be a group, the question is, is it an interesting group? And I don't, I don't see... No... Not clear, yeah. I don't think so, but uh, good question. Thank you, Rüdiger. Yeah. Can you maybe relate it to that? Um, another thing I was thinking about during the break is that if we have some tree um, and then we insert, and, uh, or maybe we perform a contraction, and yes. then at the point at the vertex we perform the contraction, we insert an edge again. Yes. This does not necessarily uh, wind up the same tree that we started with, right? No, 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 no. Because so when we ins yeah, when we insert, we have a free choice how to distribute the edges of the vertex at the two endpoints of the new edge. Exactly. Yeah. So we could have leaves sort of um, jumping from leaves that were if we have two points A and B and we contract as a, and the vertices A and B become the same one and then we insert an edge again, leaves might be transferred from A to B or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't see how that would actually become a group because that was something I was thinking about in the proof we just did. Yeah. How this um, non uniqueness, um, how that is still okay. I think I've got it, but <laughs> that's what I was thinking about. And just because we were discussing yeah. is this a group, I don't think we can have we can have this um, unique uh, inverse of the operation if we contract or. Um, ah, something. yeah, maybe. So I don't yeah. think that's mm -hmm. in any way unique. So I don't think we can make yeah. that a group. Yeah. So we have another exercise for until next week. Thank you for <laughs> your questions and interest. And okay, yes. By the way, I mean, it's, it's thinking about it that way, I mean, that it's not a group is, is most likely because for, for being a group, I mean, you would have to be able to act in a certain way uh, with, with all the, the, the insertions at any time, which you can't do because that depends really on the structure of the tree at, at the given point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so, no, so I. You, yeah. you have more choices if the tree looks like. I don't know, yeah. like a bamboo and not like the generic, right? like the generic one. Yeah, yeah. I I don't think that it would. Maybe it's an interesting new, uh, a set with an interesting operation, which is not a group operation. But I'm not sure. Okay, so proof of the theorem. And if I say proof, of course. Essentially, for n equals 5. I spare you the general case. So this is a proof which was suggested by Josef Schicho and Sayue Ki. 
There have been various versions. The last version is due to Josef, and I think it's quite elegant and uh, also tricky. And I will give you at least part of the flavor. So we have consider x in yn extremal with open neighborhood ux. Some while ago, I already started to indicate how the proof works. So we will construct a chart map alpha, which maybe we should call alpha of x, from ux to some subset vx in k star n minus 3 open. So I mean the risky open, which means it is the complement of an algebraic set. And this will be an isomorphism. Okay. And if we take here an arbitrary string y, we will send it to a bunch of cross ratios, cross q e y, e in e of gamma of x. So I will explain what we do. I'm sure that you don't remember, because it's easy to mix up everything. So before we, I go into the details, we know already that yn will have dimension n minus 3 as a manifold. So the charts have to go to something open in k to the n minus 3. And by construction, we will even avoid the 0 here and observe that this also avoids the infinity point. Yeah. So you could see this as a subset of p1 to the n minus 3, open subset of p1 n minus 3. And uh, the, the main, so this will be a rational function. We have to show that this is defined on ux. Yeah? And we have to show that we can go back. Yeah? In order to go back, depending on how we define the image, yeah? here we have only certain cross ratios of y, which we consider, namely n minus 3 many. And in order to show that this map alpha is injective, we have to reconstruct the entries of y from this image here. Okay? But reconstructing the entries of y is equivalent to reconstructing all cross ratios of y. Yeah, because remember, let me write this here. Yt, if t is 1, 2, 3, would be y1 t, which is 0, 1, infinity. And the next one would be yt4, and then so on. Recall that if the triple is IJL, IJK, then we require that the entries are 0, 1, and infinity. And then this one can be expressed as a cross ratio in 1, 2, 3, 4 of yt. It's not equal, but it's a, one of these ratios. Yeah? Uh, you can express yt4, I think it's 1 over this one, or 1 minus, or something like this. Okay, So there is a relation. So to show injectivity, I re repeat, it suffices to reconstruct all cross ratios of y from these chosen ones, which I did not explain yet how you do. So how do you, define, how do you choose these n minus 3 cross ratios? Where does n minus 3 come from? Yeah? We know that this is an expected dimension, but how do we get precisely n minus 3 quadruples. We need for this n minus 3 distinguished quadruples q 
u. And I already called them e, where e is an edge. And now I draw again, I draw again our tree. So x is extremal. So this means that the tree is extremal. Always the same picture. But it's easier to stick to the same, because otherwise I get confused. <clears throat> Here we have a gamma of x. We use very much that x is extremal. So every inner vertex has degree 3. And now here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 leaves. 11 leaves. And how many edges do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 inner edges. So the number of leaves is, of course, n. And 8 is then n minus 3. So being extremal, the tree is extremal, is equivalent to say that you have n minus 3 in the edges. Okay. So gamma x extremal equivalent the number of inner edges is n minus 3. So let me call this edge here e. And you remember maybe how we proceeded. We in order to find our quadruple, we, or, we completely order our set n, assume n totally ordered. That's just for notational convenience. So you can think of 1 up to n if you want. Okay. So we delete now e and its endpoints. So we delete all this. You can see it. So what, we, what remains are four connected components. We will get one component here, one component here, one component here, and one component here. Yeah. Let me write it down, deleting an edge e from gamma x. We cannot do it with y. We do it with x, because x is extremal, together with its two endpoints. produces four connected components. Which I have drawn and circled in green. Now, in each of these four components, you have a couple of labels and leaves. But now, using that the set of labels is totally ordered, you can choose in each of these components the smallest label. And let me assume that the, the leaves are ordered clockwise. So i is the smallest, and we have next one. Then I choose j here. Here I don't have a choice. This will be k, and here we have l. Okay. So the first one we meet clockwise. 
We could also do it counterclockwise or with any other ordering. It's just necessary to define this quadruple. Then set q equals ij kl with ij kl, the smallest elements, the smallest labels. of each component. Now, it also depends how you order. If you write first i and then j, or first j and then i, so you also have to order the component. Fix order among the components. For instance, you may assume that i is less than j, less than k, less than l. Okay. So this Q, this Q, I call it QE. And that's precisely the quadruple I use for the cross ratios. OK? So we have n minus 3 cross ratios. And the claim is that all other cross ratios can be expressed in terms of these yeah, on Vx. OK? So the claim. All other cross ratios can be expressed. Now we have to do it on this Vx, on Vx or Ux, depends how you read it, through. The n minus 3. Now we call this, this cross ratios here, as they are coming from choosing an edge, we call them the edge cross ratios. They are given by the edges of the extremal tree of our string x. Or they can be expressed on the through the n minus 3 edge cross ratio. of x. Now, I'm going to prove this claim at least for n equals 5. But there are two, two observations. or It's one observation, but splitting up in two aspects. The remark, we have cross ratios in two senses. First, as in rational functions. Cross ratios are elements of the function field k z1, zn, and these are variables. And recall, we then just wrote i, j, k, l for this z i minus z k, z j minus z l, divided by z i minus z l, z j minus z k. So as a rational function, we don't evaluate yet. Okay. So if we want to express the other cross ratios on these sets here through the n minus 3 chosen ones, we can just do it first abstractly in this function field with variables. And then we get expressions for the other cross ratios. And then we have to show that these expressions make sense on these sets. Yeah? So to prove the claim, to prove claim first in k z1, zn, and then show that everything 
is defined on ux. So there are two steps. Okay. So uh, let me repeat. Uh, we take uh, some other quadruple, which is not an edge quadruple. We get a cross ratio of uh, with respect to this quadruple, and we want to express it as a rational function in the edge cross ratios. Okay. So that's the part I will do here for n equals 5. And uh, the general case uses, again, these edge contractions and edge insertions. That's a little bit complicated to write down. So I think we will be happy if we understand the case n equals 5. So I think I can erase here. So let's see the case n equals 5. Now, you, you may complain and say that this is too easy, but then I just suggest you to do it on your own. So we have x in y5 extremely. And now, for n equals 5, the tree, there's only one extremal tree. Because we, we need to have two inner edges. n minus 5 minus 3 is 2. And in order to have a phylogenetic tree with five leaves, we just have this possibility. And now, I need to put some labels, i, j, k, l, and m. And then we have two edges, which I call e and f. And we may, without loss of generality, we assume that i is less than j and k is less than l. Of course, this is, does not matter. So that's a unique tree, unique extremal, extremal tree. For n equals six you, six, you already have a bunch of extremal trees, and you have to find a general argument to proceed. Okay. So now we can delete e, or we can delete f. The situation is, symmet is symmetric. So let me do both. So I will indicate the deletion like this. So we are just left with uh, this is one case and the other one. There's just one inner vertex left. And so we get here G I. M, L, K. And here it's the opposite. I, this is I, J. You see the four components, L and M. So what is the, what are the QE? So 
the four components are this one, this one, this one, and this one, and k is less than l, so we have i, j. In what order do I want to write it? i, j, k, m. OK? k is less than l, so it goes first. And q, f will be, oh, this is k here, sorry. We start with KL, IM. Of course, you can always permute the labels in a quadruple, but let me write it like this. Now, if you compute the cross ratio, the cross ratio with respect to QE of x, that's easy. That's easy. So we take IJ, K, and M. So if we take, for instance, we can take any any vertex, yeah, this is the orbit of an n-gon, and we compute the cross ratio of this n-gon here. Let's say it's xt, the n-gon. So what do we have? We have here, these two entries will be the same. So the first two will be equal, and k and m will be different, and they will be different to these two because they are in other, other directions. So we have we will have cross, let me write here maybe xt. It doesn't matter which one we take. So this is cross, uh, yeah, I can write it like this. It will be xt i, xt j xtk, xtm. Now I write it in the shape from over there, substituting for the variables our points in p1. And these two here are equal. So what we said before, if the first two are equal and not three of them are equal, then this is equal to 1. And by symmetry, the cross ratio with respect to f of x is also 1. So these two are uh, in our set QE and QF, what we denoted first by M1x. These are the cross ratios which are, have value 1 on x. So <clears throat> let us take another cross ratio. Look at cross. Uh, U. Of course, it does not suffice to evaluate just in x. We have to evaluate on a whole ux. So uh, for q, let us take, for instance, i, j, k, l. That's a different, a different quadruple. And it belongs again to m1x, so we are well in our subset ux. Okay. I just need ten, five more minutes. If you have a little bit of patience and energy, I can finish quite soon. So let me write brackets again for the abstract cross ratios. So we had this triple product formula. Recall triple product formula. which was, again, in variables, 
I have to use the correct order. I take I K J M and I keep I K. Now I move M here and I replace L. So I take a cyclic permutation in the last two entries, I, K, L, J. And this is 1 in K, Z1, Zn, as rational functions. Yes. So now we have some rules how we, what happens with the cross ratio if we permute the entries here and we get if we interchange L and J, it goes to the inverse. So we get I K J L is I K J M I K M L. We are not there yet. But I K J M, now we exchange number 2 and 3. We exchange K and J, and we get 1 minus cross ratio of i, j, k, m. And here we get 1 minus cross ratio i, m, k, l. These are simple formulas. You see, here we switched k and j, and here we switched k and m. And uh, this one is not q yet. It's almost. We always have to switch k and j. This is 1 minus i k i j k l. So what follows is that 1 minus q, and I write it like this, is 1 minus q e cross ratio times 1 minus q f. And now we have q expressed in terms of the other ones okay, as a rational function. So that's, that's the main trick. Now, let's inside here. And now what I will spare you is to show that this formula holds true. Here you have always ratios. No? This holds true on ux. Yeah? So evaluating on ux, and I'm not going to do it here. But that's precisely how you construct this open subset ux. Uh, the formula still makes sense. But uh, just one observation. Uh, cross q of y is not allowed to be 0 infinity on ux, by definition of ux. So this means that uh, hence uh, 1 minus 1 minus cross qe of y times, whenever I write cross, I evaluate in strings. Okay, 1 minus cross qf of y is non-zero for all y in ux, and also not infinity. So this is precisely the condition you get for the image v of x of ux. Hence, so v of x, which was alpha of u of x, will be contained in this subset. Okay. So in, I don't know how to write it. It's k star n minus 3 minus the 0 set of all this. 
and star. So this, as you re express the cross ratios in terms of the edge cross ratios, you will get expressions and they describe the image of your chart map. Okay. Now, I just did it for one quadruple. You have to do it for all. There is a general pattern behind. And so you show it again in, in two steps. You use, now once you have done it for this Q, you can use it to express the other ones. So you iterate. Okay. So you, now you can use QE, QF, Q, and Q. And you take a next quadruple and you express first it abstractly in the function field, and then you evaluate on ux. Okay. So to write down the details, it's a little bit complicated, but you see there is nothing deep inside. It's just being very organized and to keep track of all these indices, quadruples, open subsets, cross ratios, and so on. Okay. So that's, of course, you could blame me that this is not a, a real proof of the smoothness, but as you recover all cross ratios, you show that it is injective, the map alpha, and then it is a chart map. Okay. Now, if you want, maybe I tell you a little bit more about the general proof for n arbitrary uh, next time. Otherwise, I will proceed to the stable curves, which we talked about long ago, and the dual curves, and uh, showing that we have really a universal family. Okay, so it's precisely half past five. Time to stop. Thank you for your interest. Have a wonderful afternoon, and I hope to see you next week again. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.